I'm sorry, if you're sharing and presenting, uh, can you occupy the seat? We might be in your chair. <laughs> okay, we have her. The SMB, I'm not seeing my notes. Can you put some light on our face? Thank you, Slime. Thank you, Slime. Thank you, Slime. Thank you, Slime. Hello, hello. Yes, it's true. Hello, hello. 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 Hello, this <laughs> So this is the speaker. Yeah. And this speaker is powerful, captures what is far away. Okay. So it captures everything you say. So very dangerous. Very From now on, no. Oh. Very dangerous. No, no, no. <laughs> Looks. It comes from the Okay. Okay. <laughs> Captain Bay, you can start by uh, modifying. Okay. I just give a okay, okay, please, please, nice. Okay. I just uh, did you want to say something or I say? Yes, yes. 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 Yes.
I'm not a ship that in my own mind. I'm not a ship that in my own mind. I'm not a ship that in my own mind. Was ist das? That's probably the gender thing to add to the
All right, so can we start? Are we ready to start? Okay. All right, so thank you very much for all of you joining both uh, in presence and uh, online. We are very happy to be here at the SA. And uh, I want to, first of all, to thank the organizer and all the volunteers working at this big event, which is becoming bigger and bigger every year. So uh, we are very happy to be here. Most of my of the people in this panel, some of them are here for the first time in uh, Lagos, in uh, Nigeria. And so it's a beautiful experience for all of us. And uh, today in uh, our panel, it's a comparative one, let's say. It's about extortion, but it's about extortion all over the world, not just in Africa. We are trying to make a uh, yes, comparison between different historical and uh, cultural contexts, and we are trying to look at the concept of extortion and how it play out in different contexts. So today we have uh, five uh, presentations. All of them are going to be 10 minutes long. And then uh, we will have uh, 40 minutes of uh, questions. And uh, I don't know, Lucia, if you want to say anything? No, I just want to say thank you very much for having us here. I mean, as, as um, David has said, uh, for, for many of us, it's the first time in, uh, in Nigeria and Africa, and it's been an incredible experience. And uh, we hope that you are going to enjoy the presentations and looking forward to the comments. And then, as David has said, our intention is to look at uh, extortion as a social relation and uh, to look at kind of uh, uh, kind of continuities and changes across sites. And in particular about, uh, about the, as well, extortion in the particular the phase of late capitalism that we are living and the inter kind of transnationality of these uh, social relations as well. And uh, as David said, uh, we're just going to be very strict uh, with uh, presentation, just 10 minutes. We're going to have a timer, so it's going to ring. And I think I stopped talking now, because otherwise I just, uh, we're just going to go and, another uh, time. Obviously, we will care a lot to have your questions at the end of this, yeah. because, yes, as uh, Professor Aderinto said, I mean, this is not for us to show off anything. This is not uh, an examination. This is not a PhD defense. It is for you to try to build new networks with all of us. It is for you to try to interact with us, and we are very excited about it. So the first uh, presentation today is from uh, Miranda Shea jo uh, Johnson, Taxas Extortion, a Comparative Perspective of Fiscal Postcolonial Experiences from Africa to Northern South America. So thank Miranda, you. you can start. Thank, thank you. you so much, Davide. Uh, and thank you to everyone for being here today. I'm also I'm very excited to be here in Lagos. So the talk I'm giving today is about taxes. And I've been working on taxes for a long time <laughs> in Bolivia, UK, and Sweden. And looking at tax, like the sociality of tax, so moving away from kind of more economic concepts of tax to trying to understand what taxes do in society beyond what these economic models might tell us. So today I'm trying to do something I haven't done before, which is to bring kind of the work I'm doing on tax, which is more detailed in these three countries, into a global conversation about how we should think about tax beyond normative models about tax. So do you want to put it into that so it gets even bigger into the presentation mode? Does that work? Just so I can speak from here. Probably. 
Can I not go into the presentation mode? Like down at the, down at the bottom, not, you know, the list. Right. yeah, that one. I think it's, yes, yeah, thank you. So I, from the distance, I need it from my glasses. So the paper today is called Tax as Extortion, a Comparative Perspective of Fiscal Post-Colonial Experiences from Africa to North and South America. So like I said, South America is more where my work is, but I think this is a global conversation to be had. And the starting point here, as I bring in extortion, is actually to look at the state as extorter. So it's not about the smaller relationship between people, it's about the state as extorter. Uh, so next, please. So one way that uh, tax scholars, but also big international institutions like the UN, the OECD and the IMF talk about tax in relation to the development of countries in the global south is about tax as a virtuous cycle. So the idea is that, and you can start at any point in this cycle, tax revenues grow and then people want to pay tax, governments invest in physical and social infrastructure, citizens are invested in the state and the trust grow between citizens and the state, a democratic nation state emerges, which then human and natural resources are more productive, markets produce profits, and so taxes, income grow. And this is the kind of normative models we see a lot in discussion. Next. So what I want to do is to argue that a lot of experiences in post-colonial countries, and certainly in Bolivia, and from what I can see in the literature in African countries, is that this logic is challenged. And I argue that it's not just that the historical development of fiscal policies in countries vary a lot. I also think these models don't actually tell the reality of how countries are developing or can develop, and even in Europe and in the global north as well. These models are simplified and build, have a lot of assumptions built into them. So what I want to point to here is the diverse fiscal histories within which fiscal policy develops and logics that are inherent in the, these models that aren't about trust or investment, but are more about extortion. And also, I want to really point out the idea that tax policies, because tax is so linked to the idea of the production of the nation state. And one thing recent literature has shown us is that taxes don't just build nation state and tax and nation states are not, you know, isolated entities, but also tax policies can eliminate nations. So next, please. Have we got to the next one? Just press the <laughs> Do I get next room? <laughs> so there's work coming out by anthropologists, sociologists, historians, working in North and South America and Africa, less in South Asia as well, but less so actually, uh, really highlighting the distinct fiscal histories and cultures. So we have, um, in work done in Nigeria as well on like the importance of the informal economy and actually how informal economy produces public wealth in an unrecognized way. And then we have work by, for instance, Kyle Wilmot in, in Canada who works as First Nations and he's a Mohawk sociologist and he shows how tax policies govern First Nations into elimination. So actually tax policies set a uh, kind of, uh, obliterate certain kinds of livelihoods and certain communities as well. So tax policies are often seen as building nations, but I think we need to pay attention to how they also eliminate nations. And uh, next, please. Or the next one, please. Oh, sorry. So for my ethnographic work in Bolivia that I've, where I've got the kind of details So this presentation is very uh, simplified in a way, it's a quick story. Uh, there, historically, people who paid taxes were the people who were not citizens. So when the colonizers came, they made indigenous people pay taxes. Often tribute was paid in the form of slave labor, and they were not granted citizenship. So your tax status was linked to the absence of citizenship, not to the production of citizenship. And this, this idea about tax uh, symbolizing exclusion rather than inclusion, it, it continues today in Bolivia. Oh, okay, we're back. We're coming back. Work in the market. Um, and here other uh, marketers are protesting a new... Is it just, is it stuck? Yeah, so Zoom stops. So... Okay, okay. So I try to remember what's on my next slide. 
<laughs> yes, my next slide is about international connections. So one of the other things in when we look at think about these models about how taxes are related to the production of nations, there's been recent work done by, for instance, Guminda Bambra and Julia McClure on the link between nation building in Europe um, and the wealth coming from uh, from the colonies. So that the extortive relationships can both exist within nations, but also between nations. So the European nation states were not a result of local taxation. The story goes that in Europe, it was so successful, they got people to invest in the state, believe in the project, paying tax. But in actual fact, the welfare state and the wealth of the welfare state was only possible because of the global flows coming from the colonies. So that we have this um, idea that, that, this, that this model can happen within nations, but the actual nations that we use as examples of how these models work, that, that is not how the, their welfare states were built. Uh, and this book is excellent for tracking the specific ways that European welfare states were funded through colonialism. And you can see how money moves between different countries, particularly in order to build welfare states, and then pretend the welfare state was built from within. Uh, next, please. Not this, but there's a... Is it, will the, does the next one are coming? Sorry? No. Next week, yes. It's not, it's still on the same one. It's not the one. I want the next one, yeah, yeah. No, it's still on the same one, it's stuck on the same one. No, it's not moving, it's still on the, is it moving on your screen? Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's just... Maybe. No, it's not on the internet. So... Yes, it too, one. There is no two. The internet is collapsing. Oh. I'm a man. Well, I... <laughs> for, for the conclusion in general, as I can remember some of the main points was um, one we need to so the idea is then like how, how are these models of the, the, how does the vicious uh, the the virtuous cycle look if we actually input the real historical and local realities of how these fiscal systems uh, produce and work and what it, what actually happens when people pay taxes so and we need to pay attention to what these kinds of models that are that are used constantly and compare that are used and compared to the realities and say this is what should happen. What that does to the gap between the reality and these models that exist as kind of this is what taxes are supposed to do in a society. Um, so I think we need to pay attention to the uh, how these models then impact the conversations we can have about what taxes can do in society. And what I think so we need to pay attention to any luck. Yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, trying to do it. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, in conclusion, I can sum up with, with what I have is, um, the logics within tax system can vary, and we need to look at historical and ethnographic data to understand them and not rely on models. We need to pay attention to logics within tax systems that are not just about trust and investment and these buzzwords that are used a lot within these international organisations. Um. And we need to kind of question how nations are framed in terms of in terms of taxes and look at also how taxes not just produce certain kinds of nations, but how they obliterate other kinds of nations and livelihoods and possibilities as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miranda. And we are still on time. We actually have a few minutes, a couple of minutes, if this helps you to fix the situation. Otherwise, we David the doesn't, have a present, doesn't have a PowerPoint, no, David? Do you have a PowerPoint, David? Sorry? Do you have a PowerPoint, David? Okay. No. Okay. He doesn't have a PowerPoint, so we can just start. We, we stop in this console. Oh, it's your turn. It's your turn. Oh. So then, can it close down to the bike? No, no, it's okay. It's okay, therefore. 
Can we listen David if he's still if he's looking for that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, David. So uh David uh the the start of the hydrons is uh it's sort of an late time. The roots of international goods and fresh standards smuggling from India to China. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very uh, happy to be here and to discuss uh, extortion. Um, so, recent studies, we know that recent studies have looked at predatory capitalism <laughs> in plantation, industry, and agricultural regimes and often through the lens of international companies and a straightforward understanding of accumulation in violence. And in two perspectives, the predators and the prey are often well identified. My presentation today contributes to those debates in the different perspectives. It looks at the predation of forest resources in South India through an ethnographical study of the chain of extortion which runs across this illicit political economy. I think that extortion is an ethnographic tool which helps to consider the ambivalent relations of extortion between the state, politics, business actors at every stage or layer across the chain. But also it helps to get the different understanding of extortion and the different meanings given to extortion by actors across this chain. So basically the, the point I try to, to make based on my fieldwork is that the complicit participation of actor, actors in the illicit logging of food and the business requires each person to be both extorted and extorter in the chain of extortion. And this reversibility, the possibility to be an extorter and extorted impacts societies as it shapes uncertainty and trust. This is a world where no one knows exactly who is doing what, where a police officer can work both for the state and for a smuggler, where smugglers can use their power and money to become elected politicians. Yet, at the same time, in order to be involved in this business, everyone is, ob is obliged to trust the other, to take a risk, a risk of trust. And this possibility of being both extorted and extorter is a major source of attraction and seduction of this economy. Because this reversibility of position allows the promise of capitalism, of challenging social segmentation of the economy, because the lower groups in this economy can expect to grow. And this is a crucial aspect because there is a seductive element which attracts smugglers, because this economy needs to recruit laborers to work. So my research deals with what is called locally Red Sanders Mafia. It's a rare and endangered species of sandalwood which, which grows only in one particular forest of South India. In the 90s, the Indian government has signed international treaties to protect it and has banned the logging and selling of this wood. However, this forest is located in a region historically known for political violence and for the nexus between politics and business. In the, in the 2000, getting funds to sustain the rising number of political parties has become a major issue. And Red Sanders, the illegal economy of Red Sanders has become an opportunity to make money. So signing these international agreements by India to protect these species obviously made this economy illegal 
but also it increased a lot the value of this wood. Yet there is no market in India for that, for that wood. There's no demand. The major buyers are from China. And the demand, the demand has continuously been sustained by the Chinese economic growth. And this transnational business expanded in the 2010 until now. So compared to many studies which trace the predations through a global e a company, here there is no clear identified Chinese company settled in India to deal with that demand. Here, everything has remained illegal and only very few actors have the direct knowledge and contacts with Chinese buyers. China has become locally kind of fantasy where most of the politicians, smugglers involved, they don't know exactly who is the Chinese buyer. They don't know exactly when the wood is exported. They say China, they have no idea where it goes. So it's becoming a, a kind of a interesting uh, fantasy. Mm. And also in this economy, if we compare to a plantation, which is said, if I quote uh, Tanya Lee, to be a machine for assembling land, labor, and capital in centralized management for the purpose of making profit. Here in this economy, there is no big boss. There is no one boss ruling this economy. To the contrary, it led believe many people that everybody can start his own business to be for young people, ambitious people. It's possible to enter the forest and try to sell this, this wood. So this business is further characterized by the criminalization of migrant laborers, the woodcutters, and by the growing militarization of the protected forest often through an alliance, alliance between states and mafia. So the, we know that the global history of forest is, made, is one of violence, and this is the case here. Okay. Illegal logging involves a number of factors, agents, labor contractors, who are capable, capable able of monitoring wood cutting, transport the wood across states up to the port. Basically, here, here is how it works. Laborers are called by various sorts of contractors to enter the forest for 10 days in harsh condition to cut the wood. Once the wood is cut, it is hidden in safe places and then loaded at night into trucks with fake registration. And the business relies heavily on male migrant laborers from the lower strata of society. But they voluntarily engage in this illegal business to make much more money than they could in other kind of work in which they are involved, mostly plantation. Then you have a contractor who organize the transportation from the forest to the city. To... And it's an important work because the trucks have to cross numbers of police checkpoints. Once it reaches the city, a buyer takes in charge the load of red senders and pay the contractor. And once paid, the contractor gives the money to, to his gang of woodcutters. Then the buyer, deals with the custom, with the ship, with the container to send to, to move to China. He's the only one who has a direct contact with a Chinese buyer. Of course, all these operations require the active participation and complicity of police, lawyers, state officials, and custom officers. So this organization and the different stage opens the door to extortive practices at every stage and between all actors. Politicians will extort money from contractors as commission, a tax he can enforce by sending police to seize the load. But contractors can also extort money from politicians as a form of loyalty because they could support their political opponents. The police officer can also extort money from politicians for the, the service they supply and threaten them of sending police forces if the redistribution is not sufficient. And contractors are also engaged in extorting money from the laborers. They often do not pay the laborers, for example, as they claim that the buyer didn't pay the load, uh, the load of wood 
or because the truck was attacked and stolen. So in this chain, everybody is in a position to extort and to be extorted. That's a condition of the engagement in this economy. Another possibility of extortion comes from the law, because police is supposed to arrest the smuggler. So there is a system. It's almost over. Um, this is a luc luc lucrative business because they, they can arrest the smuggler and claim money against the possibility of getting bail. So there is an arrangement between the judge, the police, and the lawyer. And laborers, at the end, are forced to pay huge fees to get bail. <clears throat> if we take a short example of a young contractor, he has worked for years as a woodcutter and then has managed to link up to a big contractor. And under his protection, he started his own business and gathered young laborers, mainly from his family, using family and friendship links. So it implies extorting their labor force and pot potentially their lives. I mean, many young laborers die in the forest of hunger or thirst or of police killing. But also he will extract their money when he doesn't pay them. In 2022, he explained that he has been attacked and his truck was stolen. He wanted to grow up and deal with a buyer in the city, a buyer he didn't know very well. But he, as he wanted to grow, he had to trust him. But to do that, he had to betray his first boss, his previous contractor. And now he says, I hadn't told anyone, neither my former boss nor my former buyer, because they would have taken a commission. But nobody helps me today. I can't even pay my workers, so now they refuse to leave me. It's difficult because you don't know who has done what. It could be my former boss, the police officer, the forestry agent, and politician. But the major interrogation comes from his laborers because he knows that his weakness today could raise the ambition of one of his laborers to take his position. None of them trust him anymore and as all suspect him that his truck was never stolen, that he has organized this story, he has created this story to avoid paying them. So this reversibility of position across the chain of extortion opens the door to successful but highly precarious trajectories. In this scenario, violence is used, used as one of the modalities of constraint, but is always mixed with threat, gift, protection, friendship. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I owe you two minutes, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. So, we are still on time anyways. Don't worry. Thank you very much. So, our next panelist is Hans Muller, and we have stories of extortion between Chinese miners and short communities in Ecuador. So, Hans, <laughs> Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can. So Excellent. Welcome, welcome virtually to Lagos. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, actually, thanks. to the person on the screen, uh, if you mind, well, I can look at the panel or the, the audience, uh, but yeah, it's fine either way. Yeah. Next time we are waiting for you in person in Lagos. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <And, laughs> I'm I'm really sorry I, I I couldn't make it in person. It's such a shame, and I I hope you are in, enjoying the conference uh, in Lagos. Um, so my name is Hans. I'm a, an anthropologist, and I'm a member of this extortion project um, based at UCL, headed by Lucia. And um, I've I've worked uh, a long time in China, in central China where I've done research in the countryside and more recently at the border between China and Burma. 
And um, I've also uh, a strong interest in South America, where my partner, Natalia Buitron, has been doing fieldwork in the Ecuadorian Amazon with the Shoar uh, indigenous people, and especially focused on politics of autonomy and education and, and kind of the new politics of indigeneity in Ecuador. And what happened in the last 10 years is that in Ecuador, uh, there were some major Chinese investments arrived, uh, especially in this area of the, the Shuar uh, group, where um, a major mine, a mega mine of copper uh, has been established, uh, San Carlos Pananza and Mirador, are the biggest uh, copper mines, I think, in all of South America now, in Shoar territory, and two more are planned. They're both um, buildings by the by a Chinese state-owned company uh, called Anhui uh, Tungling, which which is a, a major copper uh, investor, and so. Because of this coincidence, I and and as I'm part of uh, this extortion project, I I got interested in the relations between the Chinese miners and the local indigenous uh, groups, and I've I've started doing some research last summer um, on this topic and and did a series of interviews and collaborated with with several local partners. Uh, who who did further interviews? So so here's a brief summary. I mean, what what happened there is uh, local society is extremely divided on on Chinese investments. Some people are pro and and think Chinese investment is good for development, and others are against and say it's a form of neo colonialism. And this kind of black and white uh, view of of Chinese investment. You might be familiar from other countries. I'm thinking of, for instance, Zambia or Sudan, where where China also has often been presented as a neo-colonial influence that plays an important role in contemporary politics and economic development, um, but also in new concerns of informality, of security, of uh, of violence, and that's exactly the case in Ecuador too. So. Um, uh, at the same time, when Chinese investors were coming in over the last 10 years, the country has been in um, in decline, basically. Uh, the last year's elections saw the assassination of one um, candidate, Bija Vicencio, who was, who was killed just a few weeks before the election uh, in the, uh, the coastal town of Guayaquil. And, and that event and many others uh, during the election Observers have generally uh, seen this as a, kind of the rise of a new violence. Ecuador, that was always seen as a safe haven between Colombia in the north and Peru in the south, is now really drawn into the politics of, of drugs and uh, money laundering and, and extortion. It has become a major transit uh, place for, for cocaine, especially, and, and other drugs. And um, the big question is, so... So, so how should we understand China's role in all these complicated changes, especially in the periphery in the Amazon? Um, uh, these changes are also very uh, clearly felt, and many people talk about the new security concerns and and what's China's role and the, the Chinese companies. And um, at the same time, it's very difficult to actually get access to to talk to the people who are actually involved, who are evicted by Chinese companies or who work for Chinese companies, the community managers and the, the Chinese workers, of course. So um, partly because of these difficulties in access, but also because we, we think that extortion is an excellent lens to understand these kind of problems, we focused on stories of extortion in our research. Because extortion as a problem is always in the, in the eye of the beholder, right? What is extortion for some? is tax for others or, or gifts for others. So, so how do different people talk about the relations uh, they're having between the miners and the local communities? And uh, as I said already, they're, they're very divided. Some people are pro-mining and some people are anti-mining. Among the Shuar indigenous uh, uh, group, the people who are very pro-mining tend to be younger, uh, educated uh, um, businessmen and, and officials 
who have connections to the towns or even abroad. There, there are some people who did MBAs in, in Canada who, who are now uh, leaders of the Shuar Federation and who often engage with um, Chinese businessmen and Chinese officials. Many of the community representatives Yes, Hans is gone. I don't want to be frozen. Frozen in a bad way. Be frozen. I get frozen. <laughs> 